Welcome to Go Church. We're glad you're joining in us today. We're going to have a great message and a great time together. And uh, God bless you. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness into your glorious day You called my name and I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Day. Now your mercy has saved my soul Now your freedom is all that I know The old made new Jesus, when I met you, yeah, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name. heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory i needed shelter i was an orphan but you called me a citizen of heaven when i was broken you were my healing now your love is the air that i'm breathing i have a future my eyes are open when you called my name Joys, all the earth rejoice. He 
wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide Trembles at his voice And trembles at his voice How great is our God Sing with me how great is our God and oh we'll see how great how great is our God and age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning Beginning and the end, the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God!
the entrance seal by heavy stone Messiah still and all alone you today. We thank you that you are here with us in worship, that you have (coughs) clearly shown your presence in this place today. Lord, I pray that we would hear from your word preached powerfully and that we would open up our hearts to what you would say from wherever we're coming from in our lives. Amen. Well, good morning. I uh, decided that last Sunday would be the final sermon in our Big Questions series, um, and I hope that was helpful. Um, I, I enjoy that kind of thing, and it's one of those things that kind of uh, it kind of depends on what type of thinker you are and everything, but uh, today's a good chance to um, just kind of pause and remember who we are and who we want to be as a church um, every now and then. It's important to just sort of get the team together. <laughs> and today's going to be that kind of day. One reason it's a good time to do this is that we have quite a few 
new folks coming, and that means they've never heard about these things. And for others have heard it before, uh, we probably need the refresher by now. So we're actually going to focus on our core values today. But first, let me give a brief review of the big picture of what we believe is God's vision for Go Church. And, um, you know, this is, this is not a mystical symbol or anything that you, if you stare at long enough, you will, I don't know, get to heaven or something. Uh, it's simply uh, triangles and circles that we use to uh, try to, as placeholders for some of the things that are distinctives about our church. Uh, really, the whole thing, we call it the vision graphic. And... Uh, you know, I mean, it starts right in the middle with our why. Uh, why did we even plant a church? And it's also our slogan, because of love. You'll see it on t-shirts and stuff. And it's just, that's the reason. We, as a, even as a core team, a small group of people that decided to plant this church, we said, why are we doing this? We should know that first. And, and what we came up with from the Bible about why would you do this is because of love. You know, it's our love. It's God's love. It's God's love for us. That's part of why we're doing it, out of obedience to him and worshiping him. It's God's love for people that, that he would want a church to be here, to reach them, to bless them, to uh, bring Christ to them. Um, it's our love for God that's why we do it. It's also our love for the people. Um, that's probably the one that comes out the most in my thinking because I care about the people who live here and I want them to have what I have. I want them to know Jesus and have eternity with him in heaven because of love. That's why we planted the church. And then you come out into the triangle there and you get what we call our mission statement, which is connecting community with Christ really comes from the Great Commission or all the different commissions that we can find in the New Testament. But um, the idea and the key of connecting community with Christ is understand first that the church is the body of Christ. That's not made up. That's in the Bible. We're the body of Christ. And if we really represent Christ, if we really have Christ, then when we connect with our community, we connect them with Christ. So if we bring them here, we connect them with Christ in some way because he's here. Amen. And if we go to them in a missional kind of way, then we're taking Christ to the people and we are connecting them with Christ. So that's kind of our mission statement. Uh, and then you have the sort of uh, circle there with the words in it that we call that our discipleship strategy. Um, and we think about that in terms of if a person came into the front door of the church and we hope that they would come in then with the worshiping and come in like to a service and uh, experience God there. And then they come around the circle and there's all of those things I don't have time to go in today. But there's a flow to that and a growth to that and we call it our discipleship strategy. Uh, each one of those, by the way, has a tool like with it, like uh, maybe one of them has like go groups because that's where sharing happens. Uh, one of them has mission trips and supporting missionaries because that's where missionary happens and outreach and different things like that. And of course, there's the basis of all that with all the scripture there. The outside is the big picture, the quick vision, loving God, loving each other, loving everyone. Uh, which is really a big deal these days to, to say that we want to love everyone. We want to take the message to everyone. Uh, we want to kind of fight back against sometimes our own uh, tendency to sort of hate the world. Understand that the Bible does say uh, you should hate the world. But when it says that, it's talking about the things of the world. When, God, when Jesus said God loves the whole world, that's why he gave his only son. He's talking about the people of the world. Important to know that when you're reading the Bible. Which world are we talking about? The people of the world or the things of the world? Very important. So we want to take our message to the whole world. We want to love everybody. Okay. And uh, that goes all the way back to the call of Abraham, by the way, which starts with what word? Go. That's really where the first place we got the idea of the name for the church. That go and be a blessing to all the people of the earth. You will be a blessing to all the households of the earth. Everyone. Okay? And then, of course, the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Is the other place we got the name of the church. But today, we are going to focus in on our values. Our core values. Um, that's because there's no way for me to cover all of that in one message. Although I just kind of did. But it was very, very brief. Um, so we're going to focus on our values. These values are the bedrock commitments of Go Church. And I do hope they'll never change. Never change. Even if uh, someday there's a different pastor. Um, I hope these values remain foundational. Why? So you can count on them. So you can count on them. See, if you know what to expect going in, certain divisive landmines can be avoided. If you understand our core values, you can make a more informed decision about whether or not to commit yourself to this church family. Or if you're already commit committed, you can remember what we said at the beginning will always be at the core of why, what, and how we do things. Our core values are designed to give us specific, practical, non-theoretical information. Promises, really. 
in terms of the core identity of this particular church. In other words, these are the values that we determined at the beginning would be held as most important. They're not our only values, but they're our core values. Our most important things about Go Church. This tells you up front what we are going to be all about. And maybe a little bit, some of the things that we are not going to be all about. Let me put it this way. The primary purpose of written core values is to clarify expectations. To clarify expectations. And yet that's not all we get from written core values. They also provide ongoing guidance for our leaders. That's why I ask each of our ministry teams to be very intentional in making sure these core values are in fact the core values of each ministry area. So let's get into our core values one at a time. And again, this should clarify your expectations for Go Church. Number one, we value transformation. Transformation. If I had to narrow it down to one thing that I want to see happen, because we planted this church, it might be this, that lives would be transformed. That lives would be changed, yes. Even that your life would never be the same because of the work of Jesus Christ through this church. The New Testament Greek word for this concept is metamorpho. Obviously, this word was a precursor to our word, metamorphosis. And that's exactly the kind of change we are going for. We hope people who fully engage with Go Church are completely transformed. This word, metamorpho, is used three times in the Bible. Most modern translations use the English word transformation two of these times, and transfiguration the other time. Jesus was transfigured into light. You remember that scene in front of Peter, James, and John? It's this word here, metamorpho in the Greek. Another time, Paul used the word to describe what happened to the face of Moses when he had been with God, reminding us that his face would shine so brightly that they had to cover it with a veil. Now, the other time this word is used does not mention light. But keep in mind, it's the exact same word. So as we read this, I want you to remember the face of Moses and the transfiguration of Christ. And here it is from Romans 12, Paul writes to the church, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Look at the underlined words. Be transformed. And note that this could just as easily read, be transfigured. Based on the two other references I mentioned, the implication here is that the light of God now shines from your life so brightly that it is as if you have been metamorphosized or transformed into a reflection of the light of God. Now, remember what Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, that we are to shine the light of God like a city on a hill. Jesus was actually talking about his church in that passage. So this is the kind of transformation we are talking about both in and through the people who make up this church, that we are transformed or transfigured in such a way that his light shines out of us in our community and in our world, bringing glory to God and drawing men and women to his Son. This biblical word, Translated as transformation or transfiguration means to be changed so dramatically on the inside that the light of God comes bursting out of your life on the outside. Notice also from verse 2 that transformation is catalyzed in some way by a decision not to be conformed to this world. Listen, there is no transformation in conforming to the world. That's automatic. That's That's everybody. That's all of us if we're not careful. You cannot conform to this world and be transformed at the same time. Are you hearing me right now? It won't work. The church of Jesus Christ does not conform to this world. We cannot live by the common practices and think or behave in the ways of the world and be transfigured to shine the light of God at the same time. On the other hand, think about what happens if we stop with a statement about not conforming to the world. If we stop reading there and focus only on our own effort to not conform, 
to this world. Even if we were to succeed, we might find ourselves just another one of those legalistic churches, not really shining the light of Jesus in a dark world, but it'd be more like we were basking in our own self-righteousness, which really requires no transformation at all. Just another kind of sin. (laughs) See, while there's a part of transformation that is a decision to be different, to not conform, It is also extremely important to understand the second part, that God is the one who actually does the changing, that he is the one who transforms you, and that he does so to the degree that you surrender to his influence in your mind, in your life, even as you choose to turn away from the influences of the world. Don't miss the fact, explained in verse 2, that we receive this transformation from God by the renewing of our minds. That's where it happens. To renew your mind is to allow the truth of God to serve as the antidote to the lies of this world. Are there any lies out there? (laughs) The world is full of lies. Worse, many of us have believed some of those lies, or at least parts of them. This is why we need constant renewal from God. We need input from God to be going into our minds so that through his renewal we might not conform to this world but rather that we would be transformed even as he renews our minds. Spiritual transformation has been called many things. Theologically we sometimes call it sanctification. Practically we might call it spiritual growth or purity or maturity or even discipleship. Regardless, the point is that at Go Church, we want to see changed lives. Listen, what we want to do here is to engage together with God, both in this service and in smaller groups and even in one-on-one discipleship relationships, and to do so in such a way as to be radically changed to be more like Christ so that we might radiate the light of God more and more. And now let me tell you something. God is doing this very thing in many lives right here at Go Church already. God is doing this. Because listen, Jesus is real in this church. The Holy Spirit is real in this church. He's here. He's working. But I have to tell you something. For you to know that and truly experience it, you will also have to be here. Does anybody really think we can expect metamorpho transformation to happen by attending a service every once in a while? No. And that's why the Bible says we should not forsake the assembly of God's people. At its core, the church is an assembly of people. That's literally what the word for church means in the Bible. Assembly. Ecclesia in the Greek, it means gathering. I could say that every single week and it wouldn't be even... It wouldn't be enough. Church is about coming together in Christ. And that's when transformation happens. So, how are we doing on this core value? I'm pretty honest with myself about how we're doing, I think. I could point to some weak spots. (laughs) But I honestly believe that people who attend regularly and who involve themselves in some of our smaller uh, groups, more intimate ways that we connect and grow, are absolutely experiencing transformation. And I get an amen from anybody today? Amen. I know it's true. I know your story. I know. This is the basic testimony I hear from people who are truly plugged into this church. And I'm extremely thankful to Jesus for making that happen. Amen? amen. All right. Let's move on to the second core value. Number two, we value excellence. Another way to say this is that we're in it to win it. We're in it to win it. Can you imagine a church playing to win? Not just kind of settling? Yes, we want to strive with all we have to be victorious for the glory of God. Maybe you think that's sort of a secular or worldly way to speak of the church. Not at all. There are many passages that would spur us on to excellence or to a winning attitude. But let's just look at Philippians 3, starting with verse 12. The Apostle Paul writes, Not that I've already obtained it. We know from the context he's talking about the prize. Or have already become perfect. 
But I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which I also was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal this also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard which we have attained. Now, this passage has some challenges in terms of interpretation, such as the fact that perfection here must not be a reference to absolute sinlessness, but rather to those who are forgiven. And it's also easy to be confused by phrases like, let us live by the standard to which we have attained, right? I mean, if we've already attained it, why the admonition to keep on living by it? If we're already perfect in God's eyes, why the encouragement to keep trying to be perfect? Or if it would be better translated as complete, rather than perfect, as some have suggested. Still, why keep trying to be complete if we're already complete in Christ? The explanation is found in the fact that we are called to fully walk out our salvation, even though in God's eyes it is already a finished work. Though we're already justified by faith in Christ, we still have a beautiful story of redemption to finish. We still have a holy life to live out in Christ. And we could spend a lot of time talking about the way justification relates to sanctification, which leads to eventually glorification. But I just want to explain today that Paul is basically telling us that we ought to live in a manner worthy of what Jesus has done for us. Does that make sense? We ought to be running this race to win. We ought to live our lives with excellence for Jesus since he gave his perfectly excellent life for us. Amen. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul calls for our absolute best. Straining forward to what lies ahead is a reference to trying to break the tape. That's what he's thinking of there, to winning the race. Only one person breaks the tape. I press on to win the prize, not to play second or just finish get an honorable mention, (laughs) to win this thing. Why? Because the standard which Christ has attained for us is a winning standard. In fact, his is a perfect standard. And so to do anything less or to think it's okay to strive for less is to be one who just doesn't get it. At Go Church, we really don't want to be people who just don't get it. We don't need another church that just doesn't get it. Do you see that there? As Paul put it, such a one, it's right there, such a one needs God to give him or her an attitude adjustment. Okay, look at verse 15 to see this. In a rare moment of diplomacy, Paul doesn't say such a one is headed straight for hell (laughs) or something else extreme, but instead He says, if you don't think you should be giving your absolute best for Jesus, don't worry, God will eventually straighten out your bad attitude. That's essentially what he says in verse 15. Now, in case you're you're still not with me, just focus on the last sentence of the text, verse 16, where it says, let us keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. So again, is the standard of our salvation anything less than excellence? Was the one who was sacrificed for us mediocre? No, and I could do a whole sermon on why we should do everything with excellence, but assuming you don't need that case to be made any further, let me move on to some actual application. Because in striving to do things with excellence as a church, we need your help. Oh my gosh, if one more person tells me, you know, I don't need the church to be a Christian. I I mean, you know what my answer to that is? I mean, I could preach a sermon, obviously, but you know what my quick answer is? We need you. Hello? We're trying to do something here. And we're trying to do it well. We we need you to come together and be a part of what we're trying to do. We need your help. You know, I mean, we could just stop putting up the pipe and drape, the the, the black curtains that just sort of help create a space for us in this huge room. I mean, we'd be fine without it, right? But it's more excellent with it up. So we're going to keep doing it. It's a core value. We could use a few more hands. 
But that's a super easy application. You know, I mean, I, I don't, we, <laughs> do we, don't we have any overachievers here? Are there any frontliners, any Green Berets or whatever? I mean, isn't there somebody looking for a little something more, more challenging than, than putting up uh, the pipe and drape, somebody that's like, okay, come on, pastor, give us something real. I mean, I want to give, I'm, I'm ready to go for this. Something that's challenging and difficult that I could give my absolute best to and know that I had done something that a lot of people won't do and something that, that I could, you know, just, just I want to do something. All right. We really need more workers in the children's ministry. And we need them to serve with excellence. How's that for challenging? I suppose if we just threw all the kids together in a room and sang kumbaya for an hour, we could get by with less people. But we try to do things right and we need to add another class because one of them is getting too big. We do things with excellence. We try to do things right. So we need more volunteers who will, be, who will give their best for Jesus and his kids about once, about once per month. Now, I could go on and on with ways you could serve in excellence. I'm sure we need more greeters for our connections team. We probably need some more help with the hospitality team. Some of you have a go group in your home, and you clean your house before folks come over, right? Because you play to win, right? Well, we, we might need another home or two pretty soon. Do you have an excellent home? And there are other ways to serve. But the point is that excellence in a church takes a lot of volunteers who will do their absolute best, not make excuses, say, well, I'm a volunteer, whatever. But do their best to make things happen with excellence. Use your response card or email the appropriate person to let us know how you can help. Let's move on to the third core value. Number three, we value authenticity. Authenticity. We want to be real. You know, this core value has a certain parity with the previous one because when I talk about excellence, the last thing I mean is a show. Authenticity means there isn't the slightest hint of fake. I hate fake. I don't even like faux wood. Isn't that a funny thing? Faux is French for fake, I guess. And somehow that makes it better. Why don't they just call it fake wood? I mean, even the label they're using is inauthentic. <laughs> Why not just call it what it is? Anyway, my personal inability to fake it sometimes gets me in trouble, you know? I don't fake emotions. Um, what you see is what you get, and sometimes that means I'm not smiling. Um, I'm not trying to excuse myself from, you know, kind of, an effort to be a nice person, but I just want to be clear that fake it till you make it is a prohibited phrase at Go Church. I'm just not into that. I really don't want any of us playing a part. I'd rather have us confessing our sins to each other in the right context than trying to act better than we are. I would rather someone step down from leadership until there is repentance than to keep leading from a place of sin and rebellion. I would rather us know each other and find that we need to forgive each other and make allowance for each other than to keep everything shallow and always easy. I would rather us learn to speak the truth in love. And here's one to remember. I'd rather be real and rough around the edges than fake and false at the core. I've said that a lot of times. Anybody starting to get it in there yet? I'd rather be real and rough around the age, edges than fake and false at the core. There's so many verses of scripture we could use to support this verse. But let's just, uh, to support this value. But let's just look at 1 John 1, 6. The Apostle John writes, If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. How much of that kind of thing goes on in the modern church, do you think? Too much. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Some of you might need a reminder. This couple who was a committed part of the early church pretended to give a larger offering than they actually did, trying to look better than they actually were, and God struck them dead. Yeah, after that, the early church got real, real fast. Let's hope God doesn't have to strike somebody dead around here for us to make sure our faith is authentic. I'd rather be real and rough around the edges than fake and false at the core. I heard a pastor say that he overheard someone in his community bad-mouthing his church. The guy said, oh, that, that's a church full of screw-ups. 
pastor said at first he experienced a twinge of anger, but then he realized just what a compliment that it really was. I'm here to tell you that if we're not a church of screw-ups, we are either faking people out or we're not reaching the lost sheep of our community. Because people don't change overnight. And none of us are perfect. While I'm here, let me be honest, we need to work on this lost sheep part, folks. I mentioned we have our weaknesses. But we need to work on this. And to that end, we just did a major series that was focused on answering some of the, uh, the questions of unbelievers. And also to this end, we have an evangelism seminar scheduled for the last Saturday in July. And this is going to be an event where a guest leader is going to come in and teach us and train us how to share our faith better in the current culture. Mark it down, please. It's a special training on Saturday, July 26th from 10 to 2 with lunch provided. I'm hoping to get Chick-fil-A. Does that help? I see more pe- I just saw more people writing it down. Saturday, July 26th from 10 to 2 for some evangelism training and, and motivation, honestly, and inspiration to get. I don't know about you, but I'm still back in COVID somewhere with, my, with this aspect. I'm, uh, it's something I'm feeling convicted about. Things got shut down, and I'm not sure I picked it back up the way I need to yet. So let's do that as a church. Like, make plans to be here. It's going to probably be here. I, I think it'll be right here. Maybe in the black box, but it'll be here at the school, I think. All right? But folks, if we do a better job and start bringing in a few more folks who don't really know Jesus yet, we might have uh, a bit more of a mess in the midst of our authenticity. Uh, authenticity. Uh, and, and, and if some of them even come to your small group... <laughs> It might not continue to be quite so perfect as it seems now. But even beyond that, we're all screw-ups, right? Uh, To one degree or another, and we don't want people faking it when they really need help and support. That's part of what this verse I read a moment ago is about. That if we lie about our walk with Jesus, all we're doing is hurting ourselves. We ought to confess our sins to each other in the church, as the Bible says, and to help each other bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, on the other hand, do I have any hands left? I don't know. But on the other hand, authenticity does not mean that we pretend that we are all screwing up all the time. That's really kind of disingenuous too. Of course, compared to Jesus, we all fail. But let's be real that some of us are more mature than others. We're not all the same. To say that everyone's just a horrible, no good sinner and and so nobody should look up to anybody else or be inspired by anyone else is fatalistic nonsense. I hope I'm a better man today than I was five years ago, closer to Jesus. So no, I'm not saying that authenticity means we're all at the same pitiful level of sin and debauchery all the time and so let's just throw up our hands and, and, you know, uh, be bad people together. The fact is, That if Go Church does what it's supposed to do, both inwardly and outwardly, we are going to have people hanging around who are at different points in the journey with Christ. The fact is that some people are more screwed up than others. And that's what authenticity means. That we're honest about it. Sometimes I'm more screwed up than other times, y'all. Let's be real. And the point is that the most screwed up people in our community are welcome to come hear the gospel at our church. Like it or not, some of them might even start to be associated with our church, and somebody out there will say, that's a church full of screw-ups. We ought to wear that badge with honor. So, am I saying I won't preach the hard truths of the Bible or call out sin? You know better. Am I saying a committed member of the church or one of our leaders will be allowed to continue in shameful lifestyles of sin with no accountability? No. See, that's the other side of authenticity. Authenticity means that if I'm living in unrepentant sin, I don't get to go on being the pastor. Authenticity means that if you are wrapped up in pornography, you shouldn't be leading a small group. Authenticity means we don't want people to wear masks, but it also means that we will be able to see each other. Uh Uh-oh. We'll be able to see who ought not to be leading at this point and who is in a position to help others and will be able to see who needs to be helped. Authenticity also means they'll be able to see people being transformed. We can only see transformation when we are honest and authentic throughout the process. 
Something I'd like to see happen in small groups, by the way. It's an opportunity to share your testimony. Hey, you know what? I just want to be honest with you all. Six months ago, I was in a really bad place. But God's got a hold of me now. And the whole story, right? Go groups, good place for that. Men's and women's ministry also. All right, number four. We value multiplication. For this one, we could simply read the entire book of Acts which is all about the church, as it should be. But here's one specific verse to sum it up. Acts 12, 24. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. What did Luke really mean when he said the word of the Lord continued to be multiplied in this context? This is a reference to the fact that the gospel movement was not a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one kind of thing, but more like one to 2 to four, to 16, to what? Anybody? 256. Luke was referring to growth by multiplication, which means that it is exponential. And from the story of Acts, we know that the gospel spread in this way. And more than that, we know that new churches were being planted, formed by these disciples, which meant that brand new churches were becoming outposts for even more churches being planted. And that's the story of Acts. If you could just picture one of those maps like you see in a cataclysmic movie about a virus spreading across the world too soon. <laughs> and think about how it begins by going from one person to one other person, but very quickly it starts spreading exponentially. And that's what Luke was talking about. Only in this case, the spread was a good thing. Because it was about new disciples forming new churches who formed even more churches rather than some sort of weaponized virus killing people. By the way, can you imagine if churches were as contagious as COVID? Why aren't they? Masks. I'll just leave that right there. I just like all the different ways your mind is going right now. Listen, Jesus expected his church to multiply. And multiplication is a powerful thing. In 1983, a physicist named Lorne Whitehead published an article in a prominent scientific journal about the domino effect, which surprisingly exhibits multiplication more than you might think. This breakthrough was not what you're picturing where a row of identical dominoes falls after only starting the first one. I know that 1983 sounds like a long time ago to some of you, but rest assured, when I was 13 years old, they already knew how to line up dominoes and watch them fall. Amazing, I know. Way back then, incredible. But Whitehead actually discovered that one domino is able to knock over another domino that is one and a half times larger or bigger than itself. Aha. What this winds up meaning is astounding. Since each domino can knock over a domino 1.5 times its size, if you keep increasing by that rate, that means that by the 18th domino, you could finish off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The 23rd domino could take out the Eiffel Tower, and the 28th domino could topple the Empire State Building. It's the power of multiplication. And in this example, we're only talking about a factor of 1.5. Applied to making disciples, or better yet, planting disciple-making churches, since we can't really talk about half a person or half a, a church, we'd need to think about a factor of two. So what happens if we plant two churches and they plant two churches who plant two churches each? We now have 15 churches. After that, the math goes absolutely berserk. Ladies and gentlemen, 3.5 years ago, we planted Go Church, and already we've sent out and are supporting three other church planters. Martin Leva with Go Iglesia Woodland, Jason Page with Makers Church Northwest in Vancouver, and Dustin Payne with Go Church PDX in Portland. Now, by the way, each of these churches are autonomous. We're not doing campuses. We're planting churches that will stand alone. And as such, it will be their responsibility to plant even more churches who will also plant more churches. All three of these churches are finding traction and they're off to a great start. So we have been instrumental in helping to expand the kingdom of God by four churches in less than four years, counting ourselves. Now, what happens if each of these multiplies by just one more church in their first three years? We had three. What if they just have one? That means we're now at least partially responsible for seven new churches. 
Meanwhile, we will continue to multiply as well. We're likely to help plant at least a couple more churches ourselves during the next three years. So that takes us up to nine. And I'm being conservative. Folks, what do our efforts to multiply the church of Jesus Christ look like in 10 years? It could be very interesting. We have a goal of seeing 50 churches planted by 2050. 50 churches that trace their roots to Go Church Richfield. 50 by 50. I'll be 80 years old at that point, probably watching it all happen from a camper down in Phoenix, Arizona <laughs> at that point. But what I'm saying is multiplication is powerful. And we've been talking about churches. What about all the individual disciples being made in each one of those churches? What about the people being called into ministry or sent out into missions from those churches? What about all the transformation that will happen in individual lives and families through those churches? Yes, multiplication is powerful. Now, let me back up just a little bit. How does a commitment to multiplication affect what we do and how we do it right here at Go Church Ridgefield? Why does this core value matter? Why is it a big deal that multiplication is a core value here? Well, the alternative to multiplication is addition. And understand that generally you do things one way if you want to add. A whole lot of churches doing that. And you do things a different way if you want to multiply. I don't want to just add to go church. I don't want to simply get bigger and bigger. Talk about how big we got. Why don't I do that? Because multiplication is always better than addition. And that's especially true when the goal is not the expansion of self but rather the expansion of the kingdom of God on this earth. I'm telling you up front that I would rather send people out than keep people in. We'll never measure our success by our, uh, we will measure our success by our output more than our input. I hope some of you are sent out with one of our plants. Each of them will need a core team to get started. We had a core team here and our plants will all need one too. By the way, if you think doing things this way won't mean fighting some battles around here, you're not well enough acquainted with the human condition. Humans want to take care of their own, right? We want to build the Tower of Babel over and over again. Well, at Go Church, we rebel against that tendency. So what happens when we get up to around 200 people? Been running 150, 160? What happens when we, we get up to 200? Oh, it's so exciting, Pastor. We have 200 people now. It's so amazing. Look at this. Look at what God has done. I'm not saying that. I'm not belittling. That's, that's, that's valid. God just brings people and we, that matters. What happens if we get to that point, though, and send out 50 to plant churches elsewhere? And honestly, we've already sent out some, more than you probably remember. But what happens if a bunch of people actually decide to go with one of our plants? What happens if somebody calls it a split? Well, after I've asked them to wash their mouth out with soap, we will huddle up and remember that this core value is written down. Because of this core value, we already fund three church plants with money we could have used for something more selfish. And because of this core value, we are setting aside money for future church plants, and we're never going to stop doing that. In fact, we're going to increase it in the future, I hope. Because of this value, we're, already just, we're, we're ready to send people out when the time comes. Because of this core value, we may never be as big as that big church where you used to attend. And that, my friend, is by design. Now, I also believe Go Church will multiply in many other ways. To say that multiplication is a core value is not only to say that we will plant churches. Multiplication applies on a micro level, not just a macro level. Some of you have experienced this. And you know that sacrifice is required for multiplication to happen. Go groups have already been multiplying. And yeah, it's a little bit painful. But we've gone ahead and done it anyway because this is who we are. Several groups have already multiplied. Notice I didn't say they divided. Why? Because when one becomes two, which becomes four, that's multiplication, folks, not division. And beyond this fact, each group that multiplies typically grows because of the space that is created. So what, you, what do you call it when you have exponentially more of something? You call it multiplication. The more multiplying groups we have, the better. Multiplication is powerful. The idea is that in everything we do at Go Church, we'll try to find ways to multiply it. 
to reproduce it. Like, what if one of our church plants patterns their children's ministry after our children's ministry? Well, that's multiplying our children's ministry. Hopefully you get the idea, because multiplication is going to be a huge distinctive for Go Church if it kills me. And it just might. But what a great way to go. Number five, we value Scripture. Seems like a no-brainer for a church, right? Only it isn't. More and more churches are less and less committed to Scripture. Why? Because Scripture is hard. Harder than ever. I know many of you appreciate that I teach the Bible without watering it down. But let me also be honest. You're weird. <laughs> okay, you're not the majority. There are only so many of you around. I mean, it isn't easy as a pastor to watch people leave our church upset because they actually do want me to water it down. They do. Or at least to avoid the tough stuff. I, I don't enjoy watching people leave before they've had a chance to potentially be transformed by Christ. Now, people leave a church for a lot of reasons these days. We've had, you, you, I don't want you to get in your mind that somebody left because of that and they didn't leave because of that. We've had at least 50 regular attenders simply move away from the area in the last three years. But I would guesstimate that since we began, we've probably seen 100 people come and go specifically because of what I preach. Many are searching for a church that is easy on the ears, and so they come try us because, hey, it looks cool and fresh, and, uh, but they found out pretty quick that we still teach the Bible. And a considerable number of first-time guests leave appalled. I'm not making this up. It happened a lot more in our first two years, you know, before we got a reputation. But it still happens today. Yes, Scripture is hard. Very hard. That said, there's nothing more valuable than saturating every single thing we do with Scripture. Why? Because Scripture is what God has said. Do you get that? Scripture is God speaking. The Apostle Peter writes, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. If somebody told me you can only have one core value, this would be the one I would choose. Why? Because every other core value comes from where? Scripture. We will be a people of the book, folks. I don't plan to ever try to convince you of anything or lead you in any direction to tell you what you should do unless Scripture is the source. And if you're a leader here, I pass that on to you as well. Don't lead your ministry from your own opinions or passions, but lead your ministry from Scripture. Scripture must be the bedrock value that anchors every level of everything that we will do as a church. Uh, by the way, I, I'm, I got a little vacation here coming up. You better not stay home because of that. It's going to be an awesome speaker next week. And the week after that will be okay. That's a joke. No, the week after that will be special because it's Bevan. But I am going to be gone for a couple weeks. You want to hear Bevan, his stories. It's going to be awesome. I will be gone for a couple weeks. Uh, much needed. We're going to Missouri to see family that Christy hadn't seen her family in, since before COVID. Uh, my sister, same, uh, different things. So, but when I get back, it's going to be back to, you know, expository, you know. It's either going to be Second Peter or Hebrews. So pray that I pick the right one, okay? Uh, that's what we're going back to, and we always will. Um, that would have been the last core value, um, except somehow, miraculously, it appears that acrostic who would figure with me that there's an acrostic here uh, and it has been formed by these other core values and somehow, coincidentally, that acrostic constitutes a bit of a bonus core value. So number six, we value teams. Transformation, excellence, authenticity, multiplication, scripture, teams. As Paul so aptly put it, for the body is not one member but many. I'm not going to spend much time on this one, but I want to say that I hope nobody does a single thing on behalf of this church as a Lone Ranger. 
We ought to go out by twos at the very least, since with two, if one falls in a pit, the other can help him up. And we would do even better in threes, since a cord of three strands is not easily broken. The body is not one member, but many. Form a team to do what needs to be done. Even if it's a husband and wife, brother and sister, whatever. Don't just do it yourself. At Go Church, we value teams. By the way, we have quite a few teams started already, ministry teams. Some of them could use more people if you aren't on a team already. Feel free to let us know about your gifts, your passions, things you've done in the past, areas you really care about. And we'll see if there's a team that needs your help or maybe even want to start a team. Uh, we can talk about that too. Let me also say that Go groups are teams as well. Each Go group will wind up doing ministry and doing life as a team. I hope you heard that. Your Go group is a team. It's a team with a mission. Everything we do as a church, we do as teams. So those are our core values. The acrostic will help you remember. Can you say them with me? Start through the letters of team. Transformation, excellence, authenticity, multiplication, scripture, teams. That had to have been on the screen. Yeah, I knew it. <laughs> Good job anyway. Now, this has been a message to kind of rally the troops and recall what we're going to be about. So I'm not going to try to turn it into something else here at the end. But I do want to spend a moment in prayer. And I hope you'll all pray to ask God, because guess what? Without his help, we would have never got where we are. And if we don't keep asking for his help, we're going nowhere. So let's ask God to help us become the church he wants us to be. Pray with me. Father, listen to your children praying this morning. Listen to Go Church today. We've identified together, we've come together as a specific local church, and you know about us. You had a plan for us, a vision. You've got special things you want this church to do. I believe you're that kind of planner and you're that kind of God. And Lord, oh, please don't let me or any other, other person here get in the way of what you want to do. Help us to find each step we're supposed to take. I've got plenty of ideas plenty of directions we could go, what should be important right now, all of that. And I, I pray even, I'll pray selfishly for myself that in over these next two weeks that I spend a lot of time with you, that you'll help me to see where I need to lead and shepherd this flock. But all of us, God, we, we all have a part to play. Help us to be committed in a way that means we'll be transformed. Help us to do our part with excellence. Help us, Lord, to have authenticity that if we need help with something, there's somebody we can go to in this church. If not, then let's, let's work on that. And that we're, we're just real with each other, not fake. No stained glass masquerade around here. Just help us be real and to stay real because it's always a tendency to start just playing a part. Lord, help us to keep multiplication at the core of who we are. Lord, I want to pray right now specifically for Go Church PDX as they are looking at launching probably next February or so. They're going to need some folks, and they, they're finding some folks there on the field, but it would really be great if somebody or some people felt the call to go and be a part of this plan, even if only for a year, to just help it get off the ground. I don't know who that is, but I pray that you would work in hearts and that you might do that, that we will send those people out and celebrate the fact that really, as you go out to help plant a church as a missionary, basically, that you are at the pinnacle of discipleship at that point. You're someone to be celebrated. I pray that that happens. Um, and for future church plants, that you'll always help us all to be willing. Our yes is on the table and that you would guide us. Um, Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this church. Please continue. Help us, Lord, to focus on the right things. Um, to be encouraged, yes, by the growth we've experienced, but not to make that, you know, we kind of become what we celebrate. So help us not make that the main thing. How many people came today? Oh, man, that's a game that just gets so, so wearisome. Lord, let us not do that. Yes, we want to be encouraged when big crowds come and we're growing, but keep us balanced, Lord, and focused. Lord, change our lives. Use us in our real world, wherever we uh, work and play. God, let us be the church, not only when we come together, but as individuals going out, that these times together would just motivate us and, and we would be sent out in power to make a difference. Um, as disciples of Jesus Christ in the lost world. Thank you for all you're doing. 
Keep blessing us, Lord. We, we don't take any of it for granted. You've blessed us so far beyond what I see in other church plants. It's unbelievable. And I just thank you and praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not Alive. Oh, my failures I try to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name. Sunday. See you next week.